it is a huge pleasure for me. I think it will be useful to start with an important distinction, a, a distinction important in understanding what's happening in the U.S. And that's a distinction between what we call public access, that is making articles that are published in the standard subscription-based journals available after a delay through a public library such as PubMed Central. And the other theme, which is true open access, exemplified, for example, by the open access journals published by the Public Library of Science, which are freely available at the time of publication. There are no subscriptions. The costs are covered uh, after peer review by the agencies and the scientists who publish the articles. And those articles uh, are freely available for any use uh, as long as the authors are acknowledged. We're not prepared in the government to say all publishing must be done in a certain way. What we have mandated through the NIH public access policy is that all NIH grantees must have uh, submitted their papers to the library, the public library, PubMed Central, within a year after publication. That does not put an end to subscription journals. In fact, they are still doing very, very well. But thanks to an act of Congress, uh, the NIH is empowered to say, when we make a grant, that the grantee must ensure that their papers appear in this public library within a year. There is a, a movement in the government at the moment to uh, consider a bill which would extend the policy that exists at the NIH to essentially all of the other U.S. science agencies. True, pub true open access of the kind that you see in PubMed Central, sorry, in, 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 you see in Public Library of Science or other open access journals is also growing very, very rapidly because scientists like the idea of publishing in a way that makes their information available to all other scientists, to politicians, to uh, other officials, to uh, healthcare workers, to um, disease advocacy groups, to journalists, to teachers. And we feel very strongly, I think most of my colleagues agree, that the more available our data and information can be, the better off our society will be. The trouble is that, uh, that uh, there are reasons why people prefer to publish in some of the well-established subscription-based journals well, there are hurdles. One of the biggest hurdles is ourselves. That is, scientists have, have learned that uh, they can make a, um, a judgment about someone's work by looking at the, at the journals in which, they, in which those people publish. You were touching upon the fast developing um, field. Um, could you give a slight idea uh, what the next decade or two is to be expected talking about scientific and scholarly publishing. Yes, well, one of the things that is particularly characteristic of biology at the moment is that it's become increasingly dependent on large sets of data. So that means that uh, internet accessibility to large data sets, in addition to access to publications that describe the results, is increasingly important. And that is a whole other theme. We don't currently have a specific agency-wide mandate about data, although certain projects, especially projects that address uh, the, the genome, the, DNA, the sequence of DNA in cells or the expression of, of genes in cells, frequently those projects do come with a mandate that requires that the data be accessible for reanalysis and for use by others, uh, independent of publication. Um, but it is characteristic of, of our science at the moment, especially medical sciences, that there is increasing dependence on quantitative, uh, objective, large data sets that are being used to inform treatment of cancer patients in my own field, change the way diagnoses are made. Uh, and um, that's also true in, in the more basic sciences where uh, large sets of data that allow us to look at the three-dimensional structures of proteins or understand the ways in which cells respond to signals in the body. Um, those, the data and the interpretation are complex, and they require that uh, we have proper ways to store, access that data, and disseminate 
the conclusions. One of the things that's very characteristic of my own field at the moment, cancer research, is that new findings make their way into the clinic extremely rapidly. And that will only happen effectively uh, if doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers and patient advocates know about these results. Right now, journalists like my wife, who want to learn about uh, a new finding in science, learn that they can only read the title, perhaps the abstract, unless they pay $35 or 20 euros to see, uh, to see these articles. And uh, we feel that there is a, a business model now, the open access business model, that allows us to do away with subscriptions and still pay for the publications, because it's very important to remember that publication, peer review, all these instruments of open access publishing cost money, and they have to be paid for by somebody. And should public policy influence this? Absolutely. Uh, the, you know, we, as members of the government, um, are paying many grantees to do research with large amounts of money. And we have a public responsibility to ensure that, uh, that scientists have the best opportunity to make use of that data and that the public has a chance to see it. And as long as there is no impediment created to the science and no burden, extra burden placed on the investigator, of course we should ensure that uh, dissemination of information occurs swiftly and efficiently. Uh, right now, um, there are, we are with a subscription-based model, there are many impediments to access. And uh, people who claim that's not true are simply uh, deceiving the public. I've been working on this problem for 12 or 13 years. With your experience, I dare to ask the question, what, what would it cost to set up a clone of the Public Library of Science? Well, um, in, uh, just to recite our own experience of the Public Library of Science, we began at a time when the, the scientific community was not yet sufficiently familiar to get going very quickly, but it cost us about $10 million initially um, because of the way we did our business. That is, we began by setting up journals that were highly selective and therefore had high costs because we were rejecting 95% of the papers that were sent to us to make journals that were very prestigious and had only the very best work to help with acceptance of open access publishing in the scientific community. But now things have changed and the journal Public Library of Science One, which you may have heard about, it's the biggest journal in the world now. It publishes yeah. over a thousand articles yeah. every month and people are like, like to be published there. They get published quickly. Uh, the judgments are made based on the quality of the science, not on how, on some judgment about how important it might be. And you generally, 70% 70, 70 of papers submitted are accepted and published within a few months. That is a big contrast with what happens in other very prestigious journals. So that is a much easier kind of, of situation to begin with. And I think now Nature Magazine, for example, has a new open access journal, which will be successful because Nature's name is attached to it. And it, doesn't, it costs essentially nothing once you have the instruments of publication. That is, you have to have a certain amount of, of, uh, of uh, machinery, um, mainly information technology, to format papers in, a, in an attractive way, uh, have to have a staff, a review team. So it costs a million or two to get a journal going. But very quickly, you can recover the costs through the, the fee that's charged uh, on acceptance. I just take the opportunity for, in your discipline, with direct links to people's health, the argument for open access turned from technical to ethical. Correct. And you have decades-long experience with research funding in that field. Can we afford not to be open with the results? I think... And especially in the area of medical research, that's true. But you, were you and I were talking earlier about some other scientific issues that are of incredible importance to the public, for example, climate change. And, and uh, I believe strongly that that literature should be wide open as well. And we shouldn't disregard the fact that there are teachers and students and, and interested lay people who are intensely interested even in particle physics. That may seem like an abs uh, a difficult field and not everybody cares, um, but uh, it seems to me that, that research that is of interest to the public and supported by taxpayers ought to be accessible.
What is your experience so far? Do students and young researchers, for example, do they understand open access? Not talking about politicians, yes, no, by the way. I, this is an important question because the students, yes, they tend to be idealists and believe in the general principles. On the other hand, I have many students and postdoctoral fellows in my own laboratory who will say to me, yes, Harold, you know, I agree with you about the principle, and you know, you've won a Nobel Prize, you don't have to worry about your career anymore, but yeah. I have to worry about my career, so I need to publish some papers in yeah. nature or science if I'm going to get a job. And I tell them, well, probably not. You really don't have to do that, and we're making public library of science journals so important that uh, you, will, you will get a job. I, I think there are two kinds of pressure that we need to bring on, on, on this issue. One is to change the criteria by which people evaluate each other. That's a, a deeper issue in the culture of science. And the other is to make open access journals good, widely endorsed, and I believe that the European Union is helping here dramatically by making a public statement that we think this is the right thing to do. That helps the whole movement and bring science into an area that I think most scientists want to be, want it to be, namely supportive of open access distribution of, of uh, learning and uh, with a, a recalibration of how we evaluate each other. You were touching upon the culture change of science too, and the yes. mindset, so to say. What is your advice to the European Commission? And I would be grateful to get a line from your side where you were quite nice uh, in mentioning that we are just rocking the boat a bit. But what would be your uh, best thought we could do? Well, I think that, uh, after all, you are the funders of a great deal of science in Europe. Mm -hmm. And you set a standard. People are even more responsive to funders than they are to journals. Journals are important <laughs> and journal editorial policy matters. But the funder is the most important person because that's where the money to do future research comes from. And if the funders say, this is the way we want it to be, um, that has, makes a big difference. I think a useful example is what's happened at the Wellcome Trust in England. The Wellcome Trust, as you probably know, is a private foundation yeah. that is the largest, largest funder of medical research in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the leader of the Wellcome Trust, Mark Walpert, um, became an enthusiast for open access some years ago, and he has created a mandate f for uh, Wellcome Trust scientists to ensure that their work is, um, is made available in a public library, which is called PubMed Central UK, uh, in less than six months after publication, and they strongly support open access publication and say that you can use your grant money to pay for the costs of publishing in an open access journal. So that has been a very, very strong incentive for the many scientists in Britain who are supported by the Wellcome Trust to publish um, in open access journals, or if they don't do that, at least to provide their papers uh, to <clears throat> PubMed Central in a very timely fashion. So I think it's crucial for people like yourself to play this very active and admirable role in promoting the distribution of scientific information. Message taken. This is a great uh, conclusion of um, the discussion. I really appreciate your time and I wish you a uh, great day. My pleasure. And I thank you for your interest and, and advocacy for this topic. Yeah. Hope we can meet directly sometime soon. I will certainly pass by when I'm in Washington and uh, please uh, come over for a cup of coffee when you are passing by Brussels. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm now I'm getting back into my bike clothes so I can ride to work. Open access and the open road. Okay, thank you. Bye bye.